recording the computer. This is the Ty Capital Millionaire Podcast, episode 84. My name is Charles Oglesby, also known as Ty Millionaire, founder, director of the Ty Capital Investment Club. We now have over 300 members and counting. Last time I think we talked to us around 320. So the goal and 2019 goals are going to be amazing, but the goal is really to get that number over a thousand and to just bring on as many people to participate and buying up this bear market right now. A lot of people are running for the hills and I'm running to opportunities. And you guys need to be doing the same too. When you see blood in the streets, that's when you want to be buying. When you see people having, having fun partying like they were doing about three months ago, that's when you want to be selling. I've been in cash for a while just because I kind of saw this coming, not because I knew when it was going to happen. I just knew it had to happen. And I didn't want to be stuck on the sidelines when everybody, everything started just tanking like it's been doing. So it worked out for me. And um, it actually has worked out for our club too, because if you look at the chart that I posted, you'll see that a lot of these companies or our holdings in our investment club have been gradually stepping up because we've just been buying and contributing cash and moving money over. So you, the stock market doesn't have to give you your gains. A lot of people are set it and forget it investors. They want to buy something and wait and pray. And that's, that's cool if you want to just get rich when you're 70. But if you want to get rich rapidly, you got to invest rapidly. So Make sure you all leave us a rating or review, preferably a five-star review. Your comments are appreciated. We will make sure to respond to those comments. Make sure to incorporate those ideas and concepts into the shows we have upcoming. Um, as I said, thank you all for tuning in. The purpose of this podcast, as you know, is to share the stories of successful African-American investors and business owners so that people can hear the stories of successful examples. Because as I always say, if you don't see it, you'll think it doesn't exist. You also think it's not possible for you. And we want to break down that barrier, that mental barrier that's holding so many people back. Not the actual constructed systems that people talk about. No, it's a lot of mindset that needs to be broken down. And so we bring people on and we talk to them. We get to hear their stories, hear how they did it. So you hopefully can incorporate that into your life. Remember that we believe that business and investing are a team sport and that business and investing are the true keys to financial success and generational wealth. With us today, we're taking it all the way back. I think the brother that's on the podcast today was maybe the second guest on the show, if not the yeah, first. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, he was, he was one of the early members, and it's so funny just to see how things have changed, but not only to see how this show has changed, but to see how the things we were involved in at the time of like show two have changed. Yes. Um, so the person that I want to talk to today is going to be Mr. Lance Pedway. I've named him the president of real estate operations at Thai Capital Acquisitions, also known as Thai Capital Investment Club for real estate. So this is going to be a big year for him. Um, he's going to be taking a leadership role on the investment side or the stock or the real estate side of the investment club. And um, I think it's going to be a lot of valuable experience, a lot of good money to be made and just a, a good opportunity just to kind of level up everything that we have working on over at Thai Capital, Thai Acquisitions. So welcome yeah. to the show, man. I'm looking forward to the opportunity. It's been fun since day one. It's crazy what what we have now, 300 members, six properties. It's, the ride has been fun. So just to, right. and this is in such a short period. So right, right. Yeah, I can't wait for the future. Awesome. So I brought you on to kind of talk about um, different things that are going on in the market. I want to have some conversations that aren't just – uh, kind of a, biogra a biographical type conversation because I mean there's a lot of things that are going on that maybe people's historical stories might not speak to what's going on so we see the bird trend we see a lot of multifamily investing um, then we also see this whole war zone versus opportunity zones conversation and then of course a lot of people are talking about just what's going on in the stock market and what could potentially happen in the housing market so I've been starting off my shows with a current event and the current event that's going on today in Twitter is this LeBron James apology. It was so weird because I saw like one post was on LeBron James made that comment about um, NFL owners being like slave owners and treating players like they're disposable and how he was saying that's way different than the NFL where the dynamics are different, where the players kind of have more say so on what goes on. And then the next day I saw this, this statement about like people in the Jewish community being offended 
And I guess he had to issue an apology and tell him it was from a rap song or something. But um, yeah, let's just seen that. Let's kind of break down the first thing, the the NFL thing, and then we'll talk about the Jew thing. So, I mean, what's your take on the 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 NFL owners and the slave comment? Um, I, I think if if they don't want you to kneel, if they if they have a, a strict code they want, I mean, it's, it's their game. I mean, you're in you're in their house technically. So this to to call them slave owners or slave mentality. There's millions of dollars at play. There's things bigger than just certain things that some people care about at home in play. So sometimes they don't want you to kneel. Sometimes they they're not going to support you if you if you are on video beating your wife or something like that. And then, and when you look at a lot of the situations that the NFL runs into, it's kind of like, hey, they don't have the communities back. These owners aren't thinking about the community. <laughs> they're thinking about Sunday. <laughs> they're thinking about practice. They're thinking about the TV contracts. They they don't really care. <laughs> about the other stuff and they really don't want it in their house technically so uh, slaves making millions of dollars <laughs> they had to stop using slaves so or slave mentality slave slavery so loosely it's it's amazing how, how loose the word gets thrown around these days I, I think what's very interesting about that whole thing is like you said it's kind of like a very limited mindset when it comes to um analyzing your problems to just call everything slavery to call everything old white men it's it's very old and it's it's it kind of requires a very limited analytical just basis like you don't have to do too much thinking to just say oh he's black he's white he's a slave um the next the next thing that i wanted to talk about is i think that you have to kind of adapt there um i think that if you don't first and foremost i'll say that and i said this on twitter is that the NBA is different than the NFL because in the NBA, the players are more the brand than anything, Most more so yeah. because you see them. You literally see Steph Curry's face. Exactly. If I was walking through the mall, I could walk past Draymond Green. I could walk past nine superstar players, and I would know them because I see them on the court all the time. But yeah. you can walk past a superstar NFL athlete, and I wouldn't know him. And exactly. That has a big, big basis upon which it gives NFL owners the ability to treat you as though you're disposable because, unfortunately, you have kind of become disposable. Their careers are like one to three years. Nobody knows you. Even if you're on the field, they don't know you. It's very, very tough to – I mean, unless you're like an Antonio Brown or you're somebody who's very, very popular. To, To your point of, like, you know Steph Curry, you know Draymond Green, behind a, a football helmet you represent the team and then let's say unless you're Tom Brady everybody else represents Robert Kraft so mm-hmm. the owner at the end of the day is who everybody gets tied to mm-hmm. Stephen Curry saying that the moon landing is fake that's not Stephen Curry <laughs> like that's mm-hmm. not on the owner of the Golden State Warriors but if some dude on the Patriots does something wild that looks bad on Robert Kraft Right, when the right. balls turn up flat <laughs> at the end of a game, that looks bad on Robert Kraft. So right. it's, just, it's just different. Two things I take from that is just the ownership aspect, which also kind of goes exactly. in, into what I'm going to say next, which is I think the NFL players have to adapt. You can't move like an NBA player if you aren't an NBA player. you got to move like an NFL player. you got to figure out how you're going to leverage everything at your disposal to – get to the point where you do have that much brand equity. LeBron James has brand equity. Steph Curry has brand equity. Uh, Kyrie Irving has brand equity. A lot of NFL players don't have brand equity. That's why they don't get the endorsements like that. That's why they don't get all the other deals outside of football like that. Just because the brand equity is not that heavy, just because you can't see their face, you can't see their brand, you can't see their logo. So I think that it's it's one thing to say, oh, we're just going to be defeated and say, oh, they're treating us like slaves. It's another to say, hey, maybe – and it boggles my mind sometimes. It's like maybe if we play in Cleveland and 40 of us on the team are African-American dudes and we all make multiple millions of dollars, maybe we don't need a Rolls Royce. 
maybe I need to buy a block and he needs to buy a block and he needs to buy a block and we need to create housing that's going to look good and provide affordable housing for people that's reasonable, it's safe, and it's healthy. And then you can create the system which what you want. And I think we had this conversation. It's like when you own a block, when you own a city, the city works for you. You don't work for the city. The city starts asking you what you want to see done. The city starts asking you what we should, uh, what, what, what they exactly. should do about taxes, property taxes. Like it's a whole different dynamic. That's why I always say ownership is power. It's not just about the money. It's not just about having a big paycheck so you can buy expensive stuff. It's about you have this people who are powerless and you're saying, how can we get power? Well, you don't get power by begging. You don't get power by yep. spending. You don't get power by protest. And we've seen that they've been protesting since Trayvon Martin and nothing has changed. If anything, things have gotten worse. You get power through ownership. You get power through the group. You get power through everything else. That's not that's it. you get power by doing what other powerful people are doing. And it's not that difficult. And that's the thing. What's so interesting is like, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You could just look at what powerful people are doing instead of trying to be Tom Brady, try to be Robert Kraft. Instead of trying to be whoever, yeah. I study them. Every time I see an NFL team, I'm like, who is the owner? What does he do? How did he get to where he, how he is? As like, every time I find a new NFL owner, I Google him and I try to figure out how he got to where he was. I'm not trying to figure out how Antonio Brown got to where he was. <laughs> exactly. I don't, I, I, he was, like, um, to that point about, you know, you create, you know, you kind of your circumstances. I spend my hours in my free time watching these wild car videos on YouTube. So these dudes driving through Orange County, Southern California, and a bunch of Lamborghinis, they go to a restaurant, no parking, so they're double parked in the parking lot. Um, I think it was a place called Tustin. Does that, does that sound familiar? Stu yeah. Tustin, California? I, I work in Tustin. I work in Santa Ana, Tustin area. Yeah, it's, it's really so, close to Newport Beach. So they're, they're at some place, they're at some uh, shopping center, and they're all double parked. The police come. And they tell them, you know, the cars are too loud. They probably have illegal mufflers. They need to leave because they're not parked in the, in the right spots. Cops being a, a jackass. They're, they're kind of being cool, but they're kind of being assholes too. And then the cop takes it to another level. And then one of the dudes goes, I'm a, I own one of the storefronts in this parking lot. So I'm going to stay right here. And then the cop just got his car and bounced. Hmm. So, like, if, if, he did, if he wasn't the owner in that lot, that cop would have pressed him even harder, but right. they were going, hey, this is part of this parking lot is mine too. Eh, mm -hmm. it, it it changes the dynamic. Right, right. Then it's then it's no longer public property, it's private property. I feel like ownership, it's like you either are an owner or you're a peasant. And basically <laughs> it's 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 really in America there's no middle ground anymore. And for a while there was this, this illusion of a middle ground. We had this middle class and now, and like, even if there does kind of, I think that opportunity zones and a lot of those things are going to create a middle class, but even if they don't, you're still better off aiming for ownership. Like, let's say you aim for ownership and a middle class does pop up. Cool. You're still an owner. You're still well off. You're still situating your family to never have to beg anybody for anything. But if you sit around hoping a middle class happens and no middle class happens, you're going to be looking like a retard. So it's like, you, you always got to do the work. There's never a opportunity to never do the work. So, um, yeah, uh, let's, let's, uh, let's talk about the Jew situation, um, really quick. I don't want to get too, uh, every, every time somebody throws out some line about how much money they have or how much power they have, their version of like the ACLU or whatever comes in and like, whoa, chill out. And that's kind of like, they believe money is their, is a weapon. So mm -hmm. they can't have everybody thinking that they control everything, that they have it all. So it's just like right there, they're showing you how their money works. Right. Because if they didn't right. have any money, it will be like how you can say anything about black people. Right. Every, exactly. <laughs> like how, how Kanye said, he, if he says, I'm a nigga, that's fine. He a pimp, that's fine. But if he says, I'm a God, then everybody's like, whoa, you <laughs> can't really say that. So yeah. like that's that that's them just using their money as a weapon. It's like yeah. you can't do nothing but respect it. <laughs> yeah. I feel like what I take from that is it's so powerful as a weapon, they don't want people to know they have it. It's like they don't want their money broadcasted on Front Street. And 
the, I think that that's one of the things I realized, like just being around Jewish people is when you have money, you attract attention. When you have money, you attract a lot of negativity. And so exactly. it's kind of like, it's like their version of tucking their chain. It's like they don't yeah. want everybody seeing their chain because they want to keep their chain. They would rather keep their chain than have you know that they have a chain and potentially have that threat of somebody coming to get it. I really feel like I'm watching this documentary on um, the Nazis in Auschwitz on Netflix, and I'm not watching it to kind of see what happened. I'm watching it to really find the truth. I think I was listening to like Boyce Watkins or Dame Dash, and he was saying like, if you really like dig down into what kind of sparked the World War II and the whole extermination of Jews, like the Jews are doing well. Like they had their own thriving communities over there in Europe. They owned storefronts. They owned all this stuff. And they were, they were probably pretty wealthy over there as well. We don't really know about that. But I think they were doing kind of exactly what happened in America. But they weren't as humble about it. They were kind of on front street. And I think that that stirred up resentment from the people over there. And so now in America, they don't want that resentment. They would rather you not think they had it. They would rather you think they were whack, they were lame, and have power and ownership. The reason why I talk about that so much is because I want that same mentality to transition over to African Americans. I feel like in so many instances, as soon as we get it, we got to show it. And that's the quickest way to not have it anymore. Yeah. And and in some cultures, like, you know, I'm always big on saying, like, you know, you don't really have to be very frugal. You know, you can spend your money and enjoy it. But also in the cultures that do enjoy it, they make 10x whatever you think is normal. Like, you right. think a million dollars is a lot. They make it a hundred million. So that's right. why everybody's in Gucci. It's like right. Grant, Grant Cardone buys his wife a Rolls Royce truck, but the dude may like... <laughs> millions upon millions this year yeah exactly so like it's, it's this it's just different when you think about money different it's just different when you think about it as a weapon or as a tool not just something you you get at the end of a service that you could improve your life on like right. you gotta think of it as a, as a weapon right right so i had a conversation with Erica Williams, and I know you're pretty well versed in cash out refis and all the stuff that's going on. Yeah. We got my opinion. We got um, Kiara's opinion from Charm City Buyers. I want to talk to you about um, just the state of everything because I don't, I don't just isolate Burr into a box. I think there's a lot of things that are going on outside of just Burr's. You have super duper low cap rates. You have increasing interest rates. You have rents that have never been higher. I saw uh, an article that said the people have spent more money on rent this year than ever before, but this isn't the, the time that we've had the most renters, which basically is just saying that, hey, rents are just stupid high. What's your take on, I mean, just everything that you see in the market, like a, a, a 3000 mile <laughs> i didn't know what that that what's your your, like your high level view there we go what's your high level opinion of everything that's going on right now in the market i do think people people are burst strategy in themselves to death like sure you know you have to cash out refi but not immediately not a lot of people have been listening to podcasts and reading horror stories of what not to do so everybody's trying to act like a sophisticated investor running for the the cash out refi. Everybody calls it the burst strategy now because of bigger pockets. Mm-hmm. But it's just a cash out refi. Right. And it's been a seller's uh, uh, uh basically a seller's market forever. Like they've been comm- demanding high prices since basically the market has been better. Now we're just seeing a change in one uh, property inventories are high. Two, people, interest rates are rising. So you have the buyers going, oh, I'll just watch people lower their prices because they mm-hmm. see the interest rates rising. Now everybody's lowering their prices because they want to sell. That's just making the 
the retail buyer even giving them even more of a discount. So, right. I think we're really just seeing a, a switch between the renters, <clears throat> the renters becoming, uh, the renters having a say in the market, basically when it comes mm-hmm. to buying, but then also a lot of people don't want to buy. <laughs> so the investors will be able to keep raising rents $50 a month or a thousand dollars a turnover or whatever, however, however they're going about it. So I, I think I think the market, as far as real estate, is fine. I, I I believe the cash on refis will continue to happen. People will continue to pay rent and take advantage of the two month discounts that developers are offering mm-hmm. to fill up the overbuild and luxury. I think the market is pretty good. I kind of take the opposite approach, man. Um, I don't know why. I just see things differently. I feel like. Um, Rents are going to have to come down. I think that the the only reason why they're adding or they're offering a bunch of incentives is because they can't lower the rents. They can do anything else, but they can't lower the rents. And the reason why they can't lower the rent is because if by lowering the rents, you lower the value of the property, yep. which ultimately means that people built these properties at a loss. And well, these developers it, will be holding for for a very long times. So they're not. Right. They're not getting out of these out of these uh loans that fast because right. people aren't moving into these small <laughs> high priced apartments. Right. Sure the view is nice, sure the gym is nice, but I could buy a house and pay less for a mortgage than you charge for rent. Right. And I gotta pay for the parking spot. Um a while back I said that homes are like bonds. When interest rates rise, bond prices go down. Because for people listening, if you have a 2% bond and interest rates are 1%, your bond's going to sell at a premium. If interest rates are at 4% and you're only getting 2%, your bond's going to sell at a discount. I think the same thing is true for real estate because real estate is effectively a long-term bond. Your mortgage is a bond. And so what happens as interest rates rise, your property value is going to decrease it's going to decrease for a lot of different reasons. It's going to decrease because people's purchasing power is going to dip. And I've experienced this while we were looking for a house and you start looking at the interest rates and people don't realize how significant 1% is on a mortgage. <laughs> yeah. Very, you notice it. If you have a $400,000 house, 1% is $4,000, which is then an extra like 300 bucks, 400 bucks a month. Now that might not seem that much, but when you look at a mortgage that goes from eighteen hundred to twenty two hundred, that's kind of a big difference. Or a mortgage that's from twenty two hundred to twenty six hundred, that's kind of a big difference. And it's only one percent. So you have to factor in taxes, you have to factor in insurance, all that stuff. I think that home prices are going to have to fall. And I live in Southern California, and so it's way different. And this is Southern California talking. This isn't um, areas like Georgia where things are still undervalued or areas like, of course, the Midwest where things are undervalued, some parts of Texas where things are undervalued. You have areas where people are leaving because those areas are overvalued. New York, California, some parts, I think Denver is overvalued. And so the people that are in those markets that own, they're like, man, this is great. We're getting rich. But I think that it is paper wealth. It's not real wealth in the bank account. If your personal residence just happens to appreciate it's not real wealth until you sell or the property's paid off. But I agree with that point because um, there was a property property that just sold here in Greenwich, Connecticut. It was on the market for about forty million dollars, I believe, for like two years. And then it, it just sold for like twenty five million, and that's mm-hmm. still a record for the area. It's yeah. just people have been asking these wild prices. It's just t- time to tame in the market. Like, hey. It's to slow down. Right. <laughs> these, these prices aren't right. Like, I, I think the coolest thing about seeing it happen, though, is now we're going to see a correction when people have money, which yes. I think is going to, because uh, I mean, if the market comes down to people, it's coming down into a bunch of sellers, a bunch of buyers. Like I know a lot of people that have multiple degrees that live in California, they can't afford to buy anything. 
that are just waiting for an opportunity. They have the savings, they have the credit scores. That's just everything is out of touch. Everything is out of reach. And so I think that's why I'm kind of banking on that happening for a correction, for a turnaround to happen so that then it can get propped back up, which is then ultimately going to create more demand, which then increases the prices higher than they are. So that's what I wrote an article and it was talking about market cycles. And it was saying like, that's kind of what happens is you have this cycle of people buying and selling. That's all stock prices are. Stock prices go up and down buyers and sellers. Real estate goes up and down buyers and sellers. So prices were going up crazy because homes are priced affordably. They were getting multiple offers. And then now we're at the point where I think Erica posted a chart that said that like this year, the number of homes that have more than one offer is down like 50%, <laughs> which is, is pretty substantial. So yeah. we're seeing a reversal. I'm thinking that the stock market is just the beginning of that reversal. And I'm kind of hoping that we see more because guys like us who have cash on the sidelines have access to resources, which is going to be gobbling up property, gobbling up stocks, gobbling up opportunities that are out there to uh, kind of double double down and increase our wealth. Yeah, I mean, every, everything just couldn't be on an uh, endless run. Eventually, it will slow down. You know, say hold your horses for a couple of weeks. Now the year is going to end. Probably a lot of people are, aren't in the market of anything. A lot of their money's in, or a lot of their holdings period is in cash. Just seeing where the things are going because, hey, everybody enjoyed these earnings, <laughs> and I hope they were like us with the stock side. It was when shit hit the fed, and yeah. we weren't looking at just a bloodbath across when we see, seeing what the holdings were like. Right. Some people, some people probably were holding out for forever and <laughs> forever came. Yep. So this is going to be a quick show. The last topic I want to talk about, I'm going to kind of combine topics because I think that they are interrelated, but uh, if people don't know, there's something out there called blacker pockets, blacker pockets is an urban real estate investing platform. That's kind of like uh, similar to, to bigger pockets, but it has a more um, vision and mission oriented focus and that there's so many opportunities in the inner city that people are overlooking. This is something that Lance has spoke to many times. Um, some people who get very passionate about this, people like um, Nita and Hood Estates and even myself, I kind of, I'm not sure if I get uh, super there, but I understand that the opportunity is there. So the question is really, um, the bigger pockets, man, it's so funny because I think that you're one of the first people who kind of call bigger pockets out on this, yes. um, and, and how they kind of downplay the hood and how there's so much opportunity there. Um, and so that's why we created blacker pockets. But then the kind of second question to this is this whole opportunity zones thing. And I always tell people like, is it an opportunity zone or is it a war zone? And are we just waiting for other people to say it's an opportunity before we see it's an opportunity, which ultimately means it's too late. So what do you, what do you say, man? <laughs> I've been listening to, well, I was listening to bigger pockets since like, I want to say the inception of bigger pockets. And this is before it was real estate was trendy. This was like still when the market was terrible and everybody will come on and they'll talk about like, hundred and fifty dollars net a door or like fifty dollars net a door and i'm just listening for the knowledge so i'm i'm like this is this is crazy like i live in connecticut rents are twelve hundred dollars people aren't making a hundred dollars a door and then i'm listening to like the larger owners of complexes they're not making a hundred dollars a door so whatever i'm listening i'm listening and then they start talking about Oh, I went and I don't want to invest in places like my wife can't pick up the rent. And I'm just like, you're just leaving mad money on the table. And why is your wife collecting rent anyway? <laughs> so like it's, it's, even it's if even weird. if you're in the suburbs. Even if Yeah, exactly. So it's just it's just weird. And and then like at the end of the day, this is just money. So like you're leaving money on the table because you don't want to go to a certain so, certain side of town like and i and i live in one of those towns where people will go oh i wouldn't want my wife to pick up rent there or i don't want to go there at night 
But hey, people need a place to live. They're paying twelve hundred, fourteen hundred, fifteen hundred dollar rents a month. Mm-hmm. I'm not leaving that on the table, especially when a when a three family home is two hundred dollars, I mean two hundred thousand dollars, and they're paying fifteen hundred dollars a month rent per floor. Right. That's a ton of money. That's a you're ton of money because you're going. Oh, I don't want to go to that side of town. I right. don't want to go to that side of town either. But hey, somebody yeah. lives there. My so, my thing is the reason why I created Blacker Pockets is because. I wasn't necessarily concerned with convincing bigger pockets people to invest in the inner city. I was concerned with convincing ourselves to invest in the inner city because in a lot of instances, we feel the exact same way. Exactly. And if, and if they want to leave money on the table, just go, Oh, you're not investing there. The same principles that are investing in Beverly Hills works in Compton. (laughs) This is the people who invest in Beverly Hills don't want to go to Compton. Right. Like, and I, I, it's, it's not that hard. <clears throat> and, I, and I think that's the advantage that people have that I've spoke to so many times that they don't realize that they have. Like, even though I don't necessarily live in the inner city, I have aunts and uncles and cousins who live in the inner city. So it's like, I get it. I understand it. I can kind of blend in. I don't stick out as much as Tom yeah. with, the van, with the vans on. <clears throat> and so, like, I think that. In a lot of instances, people overlook opportunities. They overlook, at, they overlook their advantage, and then they lose on their wealth. If you look at any other community, they don't build their wealth by investing in communities that don't look like them. They literally build their wealth strictly by investing in their own community. And if we really want to be honest, African-American communities have achieved wealth before when we were doing those things. When you had your own businesses, your own restaurants, your own grocery stores, your own everything. Now. All we have is a church on the corner. And quite honestly, the church doesn't have a track record of improving your community. <laughs> yeah, I, and, and personally, <clears throat> I, I hate churches in, in a lot of areas because they kind of just suck up property tax revenue from communities because they don't pay them out. And in the hood, there's a lot of churches that just take up really good commercial space. Mm-hmm. But like... When, when, and also on bigger pockets, when they call places war zones and sure murders happen, that's just like crime happens, of course. But at the end of the day, this is workforce housing. These are your nurses, your dental assistants, your car mechanics, like the people who teach your kids in school. This is where <laughs> they live. Right. So uh, I want to go. In, I want to go in those areas. Like. Right. They need those, they need the houses to not be vacant. That's what changes them from war zones to decent places. I um, we were gonna buy property in the very very beginning of tight acquisitions, and we were talking to the seller, and he just sends me this message, and he's like, "Hey, just want to let you know that this property, there was a murder that took place on it." And so I was like, "Dang, that's crazy. We had never bought any property. We never invested in anybody's war zone." And I had, the, I was, this is when I was kind of really close to Al Williams and I still kind of am. He had just done the show. And so I was like, I just sent him a text and I was like, Hey, I just got an offer. I got a property that I am potentially going to buy, but there was a murder that took place on the front steps. He was like, that's the exact property you want to buy. And I was like, that's crazy. Like I never even looked at it that way. But what I'm finding is, and what I'm really trying to get people to learn and this is why I always try to tell people like I did very well in the stock market. And not only did I do very well, I also protect people from losing money. And that is invaluable. We don't, we talk about 47%. We talk about what we did in the uh, investment club, which I think is around 20, 25%. And we don't talk about, Hey, you didn't allow people to buy Bitcoin at the top. Hey, you didn't um, have a sitting in cash when the market was at a high. Like when the market was at all the investment club money and the TD Ameritrade account is sitting in cash, every single cent of it, we aren't in anything. So we captured our gains and we didn't take any losses. And that to me is valuable. And I say all that to say that I do that because I've been investing for about 10 years. And I started to figure out that if I bought stuff that everybody was talking about, that everybody liked, I lost money every single time. And that's not a principle that just applies to the stock market. That's an, a principle that applies to investing in general. That's like, if, if imagine somebody who was buying like Best Buy or Toys R Us, all these companies that were doing great, 
putting on a great front, making it look like they had everything going for themselves and behind closed doors, they're struggling. And so what you want is you, it's, it's, I'd rather buy what I know is struggling than buy what I don't think is struggling, but actually is struggling. And so it's like, if I know you're struggling and I come in, I already know I got work to do. But if I think you're going to, you're doing well, you're going to overpay and you're going to have to do the work. So I just think that people have to really like you, the opportunities are in the ugly, not in the pretty stuff. So I say all that to say, buy the hood, man, buy the hood. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's the best place to invest in. There's like, <laughs> like you say, it's your duty. It's literally your duty. Like, Hey, you want to invest? Cool. There's a place right next to your grandmother house or right around the corner from your aunt house. Like that's so true. Maybe you drive for dollars and find the owner. Maybe that's so true. Buy it right on the market. Either way, you know, somebody that lived there because your grandmother lived right around the corner. Right. And and she knows your grandma knows him. Your grandma has gone to her events. That's so true. My grandma, I didn't even think about this. My grandma lives in a community in Georgia that's currently being revitalized. She's never going to sell because my grandma, they just get it. My grandma, yeah. my, my great grandma, she owned a home. My great great grandma owned a home. Like they just get it out there. Yeah. I don't know where they got it from. I just know that they understand the value of owning property and never selling. But she was telling me that like the lady next door across the way just passed away. And then like the lady over there, like she's getting older and she doesn't know what she's going to do with her home. But if you look around the corner, like there are people out there picking up homes for much yeah. less than what they're, and I bet there's some wholesaler that's calling all these old people or called the probate of the dead old lady right? <laughs> because they want it. So it's you like, gotta if, want if, it just like they want it. <laughs> right. It's like, if they spot it, we can spot it too. And we can capitalize on it, but do it responsibly. I'm very big on doing things responsibly. Like don't be this person who's like protesting, but then wholesaling and selling properties to people who don't look like you. I feel like yeah. that's one of the, the lamest things you could do. Like you were just, you're just expediting gentrification. You are just like those people who sold slaves. You're like the Africans who sold slaves. Yeah. Like, I don't even want to take it to the slaves thing, but like, that's what you are. You're selling out your people for a few bucks. They got paid to sell the slaves. They didn't do it for free. They got paid. Yeah. I, I, I agree with that point because you can easily channel it to uh, an investor that you know, or even take it down yourself. <laughs> right. But right. you don't you don't have to allow it to to get out. And it's funny when people say like my community and like our community, I only ever really think about like maybe three or four like cities and then like, you know, areas in like those cities because neighborhoods are so sporadic, but places like Chicago, Detroit, Atlanta southern uh south central la like places where black people are went and like held down for forever we should be having strongholds in those communities community centers schools small hospitals jobs restaurants like you spoke of but we aren't doing that like we we need we need to channel our our energy like you also said before and somewhere else that we need to go into the same areas and take down property like the, yeah. con- controlling the areas, making sure they're nice and clean. And hey, when they're calling it war zones on bigger pockets, which is also affecting the property value not going up. If yeah. we're in there buying and cleaning it up, guess what? The property value is going to go up. Doesn't matter how much of a war zone somebody else thinks it is. The interesting thing about real estate is people use their opinion to determine the value of the property. Yes, and that's 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 a, that's a when uh, when uh, I want to say when Nita was had bought it up, and oh, when she bought up the articles about how the bigger pockets maps looked like the red zone maps. Mm-hmm. My biggest issue with it is like, all right, cool. They want to attempt to redline people. You know, you can't do it in 2018. But my biggest problem is they're affecting our pockets by saying what's a war zone where people should stay out of because that's keeping rents down. Mm -hmm. That's, that's keeping prices down. Like 
if money's a weapon, <laughs> then this is war. <laughs> right. Because that's, that's, that's war. like, it's literally economic warfare when they go, hey, this is a bad area. People still got to live there. All you're doing is keeping prices down so you have an opportunity to come in later when the city puts in a new development on that side of town. Exactly. That's, <laughs> that's what is happening. It's, like, it's, 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 it's economic warfare. <laughs> I, um, I've seen it. You see it. When people put in an offer, typically they give you a bunch of reasons why your property is worth less. Yeah. Like that's just a tactic people do. I see it all the time. We're in the process. Uh, I work in a family office of acquiring the corner lot of a piece of property so that we can combine it with a larger lot, which we can then ideally either put a grocery store there or put, um, like a drugstore there, like a CVS. Uh And so in putting together this offer, the offer doesn't just consist of a number. The offer consists of the number, but all the reasons why that number is valid. And that's one thing I'm learning to do. Like, I don't just place an offer. I'm not just like, oh, here's 12,000. I'm like, no, this property is only X amount of square feet. This property is not brick. This property needs a ton of work. The kitchen looks bad. It's going to need this. It's going to need that. And so you can make money with your words not just by doing a rehab you buy you make money on the buy because making money on the buy takes effort you got to be strategic about how you present that offer to somebody like it's not free money there's no such thing as free money if you're going to get a a deal you're going to have to work for that deal you're going to have to be thoughtful and creative of how you get that deal and so the way we're doing it is we're, we're telling this guy like hey your property is in a disadvantageous uh, position. Like you can't enter here. They're going to make sure that you have to have a fire lane. So what you think is actually one acre is actually a half an acre with limited access. And if we build here, they're going to require you to have setbacks. And so you're giving them all the reasons why it's worthless. And that's what they do to the inner city. That's what they did in Inglewood. Inglewood and Carson is, is where they're building that new stadium leading up to the actual announcement of the stadium all through the newspaper, all you heard was, oh, there's mass murders going on in Inglewood right now. There's blood in the streets. It's a gang war going on right now. And so like there are actual residents who got scared and sold their properties. I went to law school with a girl and her brother was like, I can't raise my kids here. We got to get out of Inglewood. We got to go. And he sold his house and he took a massive loss to to sell his house because he was a distressed seller. Somebody scooped it up. And they're gonna make money off of his fear that wasn't even like real. <laughs> yeah, that was that was that wasn't even real. Like, sh- like crime is everywhere. Like, a lot of sure these crimes are are random. Hey, maybe you can be robbed at night. W- will it happen? Probably not. And then, if you look at any map of any city, look where the hood is. I'm pretty sure there's good on and off ramps. It's not that far from downtown. <laughs> like, it's not that far from Main Street. Like, it's right. prime location. It's probably the best location in the world. But guess what? You get off at the next exit because you don't want to drive through that area. Right. So if they just clean that up, gentrify it, <laughs> so you will, like, now it's a good area. Now right. the houses went from 50000 to 150000 to now right. it's the now it's where the the medical students live like it's mm-hmm. not that hard to to change these areas because they're right. prime real estate it's just people don't see them as prime real estate yep. but people from the other side of town see it as prime real estate they're just waiting for the city to zone it right <laughs> they're waiting for the right team to move or want to move like some of these plans are 15 20 years out right. some people see it some people are just living day to day yeah <laughs> so the people who are living day to day go oh my god my rents are rising the people playing 20 years out are going oh all right you know this crime oh that mall closed that'll make a good football stadium let mm-hmm. me call my friend who owns whatever team they're gonna put in there hey you want to come to la i got the right area to change right <laughs> right that's exactly that, what's going on that's what i was telling eric i was saying like these guys have friends like if you are successful and wealthy you're gonna have a lot of friends that are successful and wealthy you guys are gonna make moves that are advantageous that make yourselves more successful and wealthy and i don't blame them for doing that they're supposed to do that 
The only reason why I bring it up is I'm saying, why can't we do it too? Why can't we say, hey, man, you got Tulsa Real Estate Fund, you have X. Okay, I have Thai Capital Investment Club, I have X. Okay, you have Housing JV, you have X. You have this, okay, where are we going? Where can we maximize every cent? Where can we, can, where can we create a school? Where can we change things? So you don't have Dr. Umar over here like, I just, I just got to build my school. I got to figure out a way to make it happen. It's like, nah, we already worked you into the plan, like a master yeah. plan. Yeah, it needs to be a master plan. I feel okay. like, you know, there's a lot of people, um, a lot of people kind of wanting to do something, but nobody ever like convenes like that, that secret meeting that takes mm-hmm. place in like some far away hotel in North Virginia. <laughs> like other, other places, other people do it. <laughs> like and that's, that's all they do. Like, and it's like, very, like, very organized. Like exactly. When they, the Koch they, brothers go spend four hundred million dollars on a campaign, they get together in a in a nice hotel in northern in Palm Beach or something. They talk about who they're gonna put their money behind, what type of commercials they're gonna run, like which areas the commercials are gonna run. We're just going, hey, we want black people to be great. So I'm gonna send some right. kids to school. I'm gonna I'm gonna look at their community center. Like <laughs> it's more to it than that. Like mm-hmm. it, like there like there's levels and we're still not not reaching those those max levels yep absolutely so i promised a quick episode i, I want to get this out today as a christmas present to the people and i want to just keep recording shows throughout the week i appreciate you for coming on the show yes, um sir. any any last words you want to leave with the people keep buying <laughs> when everybody's selling keep buying there's opportunities Amen. everywhere don't listen to the articles <laughs> don't listen to your timeline, if you see a deal, if the numbers work, the numbers work. That's that's all that matters. The numbers, there's opportunities everywhere. Make sure you take them. Amen. Cool. Where can they find you on the internet? On Twitter, uh, my handle is cashflowing, R-E, uh, cashflowing without the G, so F-L-O-W-I-N-R-E. Uh, and same on Instagram, cash flowing R E. Uh, and that's it. Cool. So this has been episode 84. I, I think it's 84. I hope it's 84. I'm pretty sure it's 84. <laughs> I don't think I did an episode after the conversation on opportunity zones. What's really cool is this week I'm supposed to be bringing on re unique, the, um, real estate investor and just super successful person out of Atlanta and also a very attractive young lady. Um, <laughs> She is supposed to be coming on here to give us the other side of Opportunity Zones. Her take is that Opportunity Zones might actually be detrimental to the hood. I think that um, anything that you aren't educated on is detrimental. So I, I, st- I want to see what her take is. She's a very smart person, very successful, a lot going for what's her. What's her stance for detrimental? Why, why bad? Um, I think that I'm not really sure. I need to kind of do a little bit more digging, but... I want to say it has something to do with people just being taken advantage of. Um, I think that's uh, that's kind of her crux. So I mean, yeah, hey, these communities have to be cleaned up. <laughs> like they're they're low census tracts. Like right. the interesting yeah. thing about it is, I remember people were questioning whether they'd be able to find a way to get money into these communities. Like when uh, when Trump was warning, they were saying, "Oh, yeah, he's he's making all these promises to all these areas that are underprivileged." But how are we going to get people to invest in those areas? People don't want to invest in those areas. And then you pop up and they have opportunity zones. Yeah, exactly. Like for uh, real quick, like for, we were just seeing that uh, that deal with the barber shop. Now that's that's owning commercial properties. That's let's say let's say there's five chairs in there. That's five jobs right there. Mm-hmm. You know, that may maybe somebody buys the next door and the next door. Now you got a store, the dry cleaners, and a deli. Now that neighborhood's <laughs> better than it was before that's all right. it takes it's not right. it's not rocket science it's not rocket science it's like what's his name said he said the community that pops is the community that you invest in if you want your community to a pop you need to invest in your community so <laughs> with yes. that this is episode 84 we're going to bring Lance back we're going to put out a lot more content i apologize for the weak absence of not putting anything out for you guys but we're going to Go hard in the paint and get a lot more quality content out for you, educating and informing people.
talking about current events, talking about what we have going on in the investment club, which I think we owe people. Everybody always asks like, Hey, what do you guys do? How do you do it? How does it work? So we're going to work on having an information kind of podcast talking about all the deals we've acquired yeah, and the success of 2018. So yeah, I appreciate you guys all for tuning in. This is Charles Oglesby, also known as Todd Millionaire. You can find us at info at Capital Todd. And you can also find us at www.capitaltodd.com. If you're interested in joining the Real Estate Investment Club, email Lance. The email address is propertymanagement at capitaltodd.com. If you're interested in joining the Stock Investment Club, email Candice. That email is membership at capitaltodd.com. Uh, my name is Charles Oglesby. Oh, last thing is we are running an LLC special for today. If you're somebody who listened to this entire podcast, the special is $99. I will give it to you for $50. If you made it all the way through, email me, say, I listened to the end and we'll do that. If you didn't, you got to pay the 99 and that's just for today because we're going back up to 250 tomorrow. My name is Charles Oglesby, also known as Todd Millionaire, signing off.